exceptions in Python are cheap. Okay, I know it's a cheap shot, but I feel so much better now. Let's say you need to throw an arrow if value is less than 10. You'd write the following code, and if it happens, what you get is a value error. This is not very useful, and someone who gets this error needs to look up the implementation to figure out what exactly is happening. But what we can do instead is declare our own exception. To do that, you just need to define a class, make value error a base class, and even the empty implementation is fine. If you rewrite code above to raise a value to small error instead, then to someone who sees that error, it will make much more sense than a generic value error. Making copies of lists in Python is really easy. Downstairs right now is a copy of myself. All you need to do is use a factory method. For instance, for list, it will be list of L0. Now, if you modify L0 element, you can see that L1 hasn't changed. However, this doesn't work for custom objects. What factory method does is creates a shallow copy of a list. To demonstrate, let me create my own class, let's say L, and then I'll create a list of L and a shell of copy of L0. As you can see, we have an exact copy here. The problem with the shallow copy is if you modify a value, it will be changed in both of the lists because although we created a copy of the list, we didn't create a copy of the custom elements. However, Python has a built-in mechanism for creating deep copies. All you need to do is import copy module and instead of a factory method called copy deep copy. Now, if I modify an element, you will see that L0 list element has changed. L1 element also has changed because it's a shallow copy. However, L2 element stayed the same. Abstract base classes are useful constructs because they ensure that derived classes implement certain methods from the base class. This man was the real father of abstract expressionism. This also makes code more readable and maintainable because for one, abstract base classes cannot be instantiated and for another, they can be used to enforce a contract for derived classes. Unlike other languages, Python does not have a keyword for abstract base classes, but it does have the ABC module, which provides the ABC class and the abstract method decorator. To define a shape class that requires derived classes to implement area and perimeter methods, you can use the following code. Now, if we create a derived class and forget to implement the required methods, Python will raise an error when we try to instantiate it. So let's add the required methods. Now we can create an instance of circle and use its methods. This does feel a bit dirty and verbose, but it is a powerful feature of Python that can help you write more maintainable and readable code. Abstract base classes were introduced in Python 3.4, so if you are using an older version of Python, you will need to use the ABC module from the standard library. This explains why the ABC module is not imported by default in Python, as it is not needed for most use cases. Named tuples are one of my favorite features of Python, because I like static typing and type hints. J Tuple seems to be the only person who knows how to make what I need. I think anyone coming from real programming languages like C++ or Java will appreciate this feature because it allows you to define a tuple with named fields, which makes the code more readable and maintainable. Just like regular tuples, named tuples are immutable, but they allow you to access the fields by name instead of index. To use them, you need to import named tuple factory function from the collections module. And here is how you define a named tuple point with two fields, x and y. Now, if you create an instance of this named tuple, you can access the fields by name. Of course, you can still access the fields by index, but it's not recommended as it makes the code less readable. Although named tuples is a step forward in terms of static typing, it is still not as powerful as data classes introduced in Python 3.7. Personally, I prefer data classes. Data classes are insane. They allow you to create ready-to-use classes with minimal boilerplate code. Transfer. 
all data to crystal board. They were introduced in Python 3.7 and are a great way to define classes that are primarily used to store data. They automatically generate methods like init, wrapper, eq, and hash based on the class attributes. This makes them very convenient for creating classes that are used to represent data structures. To use data classes, you need to import the data class decorator from the data classes module. This is an example of how you can define a data class called points with fields x and y. Now, if you create an instance of this data class, you can access the fields by name. Let's try the default implementation of str and wrapper that are automatically generated. As you can see, it prints data class name, attribute name, and attribute values. I personally like to use data classes for data transfer objects and other simple data structures. They are also great for defining configuration objects as they allow you to define default values for the fields. For example, you can define a data class with default values like this. Thank you for a great class today, ladies. Python classes have two types of variables, class variables and instance variables. Class variables are shared across all instances of the class while instance variables are unique to each instance. To demonstrate this, let's create a simple class called point that has a class variable default color and instance variables x and y. Now, if you create instances of this class, both of them will share the same class variable default color but have their own instance variables x and y. If you change the variable default color to let's say blue, it will affect all instances of the class. Python classes can have three types of methods. Instance methods, class methods, and static methods. Instance methods are the most common type of methods, and they operate on the instance of the class. They take self as the first parameter, which refers to the instance itself. Class methods are methods that operate on the class itself, rather than on an instance of the class. They take CLS as the first parameter, which refers to the class itself. To define a class method, you use the class method decorator. Class methods are often used to create factory methods that return instances of the class. Static methods are methods that do not operate on the instance of the class, but are related to the class in some way. They do not take self or CLS as the first parameter. To define a static method, you use the static method decorator. Static methods are often used for utility functions that are related to the class, but do not need access to the instance or class variables. Dictionaries are the most important data structure in Python, and they're used to store key value pairs. They're also known as associative arrays or hash maps in other programming languages. Dictionaries are mutable, which means you can change their contents after they are created. Dictionaries are represented by the dict class in Python, and they are created using curly braces or the dict constructor. The keys in a dictionary must be unique and immutable, while the values can be of any type. Here is how we can create a dictionary using curly braces syntax, or this way with a dict constructor. It's a dictionary. Since Python 3.6, dictionaries maintain the insertion order of the keys, which means that when you iterate over a dictionary, the keys will be returned in the order they were added. This is a significant improvement over earlier versions of Python where dictionaries did not guarantee any specific order. To iterate over a dictionary, you can use its items method, and as you can see, is in the same order. However, it is important to know that this behavior is an implementation detail of CPython as should not be relied upon in code that needs to run on other Python implementations. If you need a guaranteed order, you can use collections order dict class which was introduced in Python 3.1. When accessing values in a dictionary, you can use square brackets with the key. However, if the key does not exist in a dictionary, this will raise a key error. To avoid this, you can use the get method, which returns none, or optionally a default value if it's specified. Just look up the word handsome in the dictionary. If you need to check if a key belongs to a dictionary, you can use the in operator. It returns true if name is inside the dictionary or false otherwise. There is a special type of dictionary called default dict, which is a part of the collections module. A default dict allows you to specify a default value for keys that do not exist in a dictionary. This can be useful when you want to avoid key error exceptions and provide a default value automatically. The following line creates 
an instance of default dict and passes int as a default as a factory method, which means if values are not there, it will use the default value of int, which is zero. Let's add some values to the dictionary itself and then try to get the value by key C, which does not exist in a dictionary. As you can see, it returns zero. You can also use your own factory methods. For instance, in this example, I am creating a default dict with a factory method which returns current date time if the key is not found. Therefore, when retrieving a key, we will get a nice value instead of some constant. Python has an incredible dictionary utility class, ChainMap, which allows you to combine multiple dictionaries into a single view so that you can create a virtual dictionary backed by multiple dictionaries. This is useful when you want to search for a key in multiple dictionaries without merging them into one. Let's say I have two dictionaries. To create a chain map on top, I will pass them both to the chain map constructor. Now, if I try to look up chain map for values A, B and C, they will be all found despite being in different dictionaries. Note that chain map is not read-only and all of the modification operations like assign and delete will modify the first dictionary passed to the chain map. In this case, dict1. You can protect a dictionary from modifications by using the mapping proxy type class from the types module. We've got to protect our phony baloney job, gentlemen. This creates a read-only view of the original dictionary, allowing you to access its contents without allowing modifications. If you have an original dictionary, to create a mapping proxy type, you just pass it as a constructor argument. Let's test if we can read the value. And yes, that's all fine. However, if you try to change a value, you'll get a type error. Mapping proxy object does not support item assignment, which is by design. Python has six types of arrays that are commonly used. The first one is a list. It's mutable, it can hold items of different types, and it's technically not an array because array is an immutable data structure that holds a fixed number of items of the same type. The second one is a tuple. It's immutable, it can hold items of different types as well. The third one is array module. Array.array .array is mutable, can hold items only of the same type. The first argument is called a type code, and in this case i means signed integers. The fourth type is a string. It's immutable, it can hold items only of the same type, which are characters. The fifth type is bytes object, which is an immutable sequence of bytes. And the sixth is a byte array object, but unlike bytes, it's mutable. If you thought it's confusing, you're right, but it's actually not that bad. If you need to store arbitrary items of different types, use a list or a tuple, depending on whether you need mutability or not. If you have numeric items of the same type, and need to perform mathematical operations, use the array module. If you need to store characters, use a string. If you need to store bytes, use byte or byte array, depending on whether you need mutability or not. And of course, if you're not sure, just use a list. At least you won't write code worse than an AI. You now know the basics of arrays in Python. Gear-mounted camera arrays feed directly into his optic nerves. If you need to store a collection of unique items, use a set. Python even has a special treatment for sets, which makes it very efficient. And that includes syntax as well. This is how we defined a simple set. But be careful, to create an empty set, you must use the set constructor rather than empty curly brackets. Because empty curly brackets will create a dictionary instead. We should proceed with a bit more caution. To add an item, just use add method. There is also a remove method. You can use in operator to check if an element is in a set. Len function to get the number of items in the set. For loop works for iterating through the elements. And also you can use more interesting operations like union, intersection, or difference. To perform a union, just use bitwise or operator. For intersection, it's bitwise and, minus for difference, and so on. You should check set documentation for more interesting operations. If you need a set that is immutable, you can use a frozen set. Now it's frozen. This is useful when you need a set as a key in a dictionary or an element in another set. 
you can perform the same operations on a frozen set as you can on regular set, but you cannot add or remove items. They will raise an attribute error. You can create frozen sets from existing sets or convert frozen sets to back to regular sets. If you need to store a collection of items where duplicates are allowed, you could use a bag, also known as a multi-set. Python does not have a built-in bag type, but you can use collections counter class to achieve this. This is how you create a multi-set or a bag. This is how you update it. To remove an element, you will use subtract method because it essentially subtracts one from an existing element. You can check the count of items in a bag by using it like a dictionary. In this case, it's one. Important thing to note is if you want to get the total number of items in the bag, you need to use some function. Because if you use length function, you will only get the number of unique items in the bag. A stack is another essential classic data structure, and Python has support for it. The simplest version of a stack is a list. This ain't a motherfucking stack. Then to add elements to the stack, you can just use the append function. Funny thing about the list is it has a pop function, like it's designed to function as a stack. For better performance, especially for large stacks, you can use dq from collections module. It's got the following advantages. It has O1, time complexity for append and pop operations. It is optimized for fast appends and pops from both ends. It's thread safe, meaning that it can be used in multi-threaded applications without additional locking mechanisms. Let's create the DQ and elements on the top of the stack. Just like with the list, to remove the top item from the stack, you can use the pop method. You can use the same stack operations on GQ as for lists from the previous Python tip. So if you like these tips, please like the video and please subscribe. See you later, I hope.